about these theories? Does one leap out at you more than the other? Not yet. I'm still in the school to keep all options open, if it's possible. When you have a high explosion, you have disintegration of all material in the vicinity of the explosion. In a soft fuel air explosion, it peels the metal back, and that's what it showed on, at Calverton when they put it back together. In addition, uh, we have also reconstructed the interior uh, of the aircraft, putting the seats and galleys back together again. But they always showed you only the right side, the starboard side of the airplane. When I saw photographs of the left side with that large indentation forward of the wing, then I immediately was curious what in the world could cause it to be dented in. It would have to be something external to the aircraft. And though I didn't buy necessarily the missile theory, in fact, I had debated Pierre Salinger for 40 minutes on his idea, which I didn't, don't think had validity, about a missile coming head on at the aircraft. Nonetheless, I was really, at this point, upset that we hadn't heard about that evidence. Mr. Kalston, being that a missile is still one of the theories, is there anything being done to protect other aircraft from a possible missile if that is still one of the theories? Yeah, I, I said earlier and I would continue to say that any information that comes up in this investigation that, uh, that is particularly uh, on point to the traveling public, in particular the, the air traveling public, has been made available to the FAA. This part right here. Okay. okay. Then a new theory emerges. Yeah a theory that will become the government's final word on the tragedy that befell TWA 800. TWA crash investigators are wondering if a well-known fact of aviation and a conversation in the cockpit shortly before the crash could suggest a reason why TWA Flight 800 blew up. On the voice cockpit recorder, the 747's engineer is heard beginning the process of cross-feeding, that is, moving fuel through various fuel tanks. Now, the National Transportation Safety Board plans tests to see how much static electricity could have been created by that action. The theory that an electrostatic spark ignited the plane's center wing tank is considered the leading theory in the investigation. It was this theory that a defect in the plane's center wing tank destroyed the 747 that created a furor that has raged to this day. When I saw that cartoon, I was on a mission. We've got independent investigators, family members, and eyewitnesses that just don't buy the FBI and NTSB story. We know a missile brought the aircraft down. So I spent two and a half years in submarines in World War II. Became a naval aviator thereafter, went up the carrier route, uh, culminating in command of one of our big carriers. In combination with uh, the former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Admiral Tom Moore, uh, we uh, agreed to uh, be part of what is really an informal association. In the first place, there's no question about the fact that an airplane was shot down. There's no question about the fact that that airplane makes that same flight practically every day. Uh, there's no question about the fact that uh, there was, I don't know, hundreds of witnesses saw the, which was a, clearly a rocket, uh, rise from the surface of the sea, apparently, and strike the aircraft. And one of the witnesses that was not able to testify in that first press conference was Captain Mundo. He had been a, a TWA captain with, I think, at least 3,000 hours of experience or more in the 747. He knew that airplane. He had flown as the flight engineer from, that, from Athens to Kennedy before that airplane took off a few hours later. As part of his duty was to adjust the fuel throughout the aircraft. They used the center wing tank. It has a sump pump, and he used that sump pump to take out any residual uh, jet fuel and any water that's present as there always is some water present and that's why they have the sump pumps. And then they took off three hours later about from Kennedy in another cross ocean flight. And I asked Captain Mundo, you telling us here that you evacuated that tank 
why was it not filled in the next flight? He said, because instead of going as far as Athens, they were only going to Paris and they didn't need it. Consequently, we know that tank was empty. Well, that means it had a thimbleful of kerosene or the equivalent vapor. This is a huge tank. What's bigger than this room, literally? And there's no way that you can ignite a thimbleful of kerosene and blow off the left wing of the strongest airplane ever built. I am, in fact, Commander William S. Donaldson, U.S. Navy, retired, and currently a chief uh, investigator for an organization by the name of ARAP, Associated Retired Aviation Professionals. Caltech spent I don't know how much, how many hundreds of thousands of dollars, using a blowtorch, literally, at 20 times atmospheric pressure, trying to get this kerosene to light. Well, they finally got it to do it. Then it, NTSB calls it an explosion. And in a letter, the last letter I wrote to uh, Mr. Hall, I told him, you put a fireman in that tank with the proper apparatus and a fire suit, asbestos uh, or whatever they use now, he could have sat there during the middle of their explosion because the max pressure was about 39 pounds per square inch. How does that destroy an aircraft like this? Part of, of this, we're going to make it a mechanical, and we need to have an internal explosive force going outward and downward. They took the pieces, these large pieces of the floor of the center wing tank that they recovered, they put them out over that keel beam and massively shoved them downward. James Sanders is a retired cop and investigative journalist. So you have this U-shaped floor of the center wing tank as the plane is over. now reconstructed at Calverton. Correct, but I have the photos. How do you know that it's been bent down by somebody? Because I have the photos of these large pieces of the floor of the center wing tank shortly after they were brought into the hangar. They don't have that bend in them. Later, before a Senate committee, NTSB official Hank Hughes assigned the task of reconstructing the plane's interior, painted a picture of investigative impropriety he claimed to have witnessed at Calverton. But I actually saw this man with a hammer pounding on a piece of evidence trying to flatten it out. What was the purpose of his doing that? Uh, I have no idea, sir. Another problem that occurred, uh, and it was recognized about two months into the investigation, was the disappearance of parts from the hangar. We found that uh, seats were missing and, and other evidence had been disturbed. The FBI, on my last complaint, did act and they found that uh, 3 o'clock on Saturday morning, uh, two or three of their own agents were in our hangar. Uh, it was not authorized. I supervised that project, and these people had no connection to it. On March 10, 1997, when the Press Enterprise in Riverside, California, put out a story that an old retired cop turned investigative reporter had forensic evidence of red residue that was consistent with a solid fuel missile there, and I might add since then, that same evidence has forensically been tested from down in here, has the same elements as my test up here, except the all-important chlorine, which is the oxygen that a solid fuel has to have in order to perform, is also down in here. What did the residue tell you? What did you find out by having residue taken from the wreckage that was obtained by you? The residue told me that it was consistent with two things. Initially, I said the one thing. It's consistent with two things. It's consistent with an incendiary warhead on top of a solid fuel missile. I had that analysis done by a recently retired scientist who worked in the warhead industry and had a background in solid fuels. He was the first one that took it the next step from being consistent with solid fuels to saying, no, you've got this 18% magnesium and this 12% calcium. So, Sanders, you're looking at a current generation incendiary warhead. And I've confirmed through multiple Navy pilots that indeed that is current generation technology, the incendiary warhead concept for anti-aircraft missiles. Tom Stalkup is a physicist and head of FIRO the Flight 800 Independent Researchers Organization. But the residue, Sanders just did elemental analysis, getting a little technical here, but he found things like magnesium and, and uh, silicon and things like that. And yeah, you find some of those things. 
in other materials, but not in those those who percentages. Who finds the petin in the uh, RDX? Who? Once you find them, you know it's an explosive. You Who's found them? How do you? The know FBI. That? That's a, that's true. That's one hundred percent. That's they they admit that, and they say there's no evidence of a missile. Why? Does the FBI have any information about the red residue that has not been shared with the safety board? Uh, we have no information from the FBI or uh, any information from our own uh, investigators to uh, uh, to substantiate the uh, theory that's in the in the newspaper article. Nevertheless, we're going to we're going to take a very close look at uh, everything that uh, has been raised. Sanders' chemical residue had been extracted from small squares of the 747 seat material. Material furnished by a whistleblower, a senior manager at TWA. In a highly public and highly unusual case, the Justice Department arrested Sanders and his wife Liz, raising alarm among many that a journalist was being persecuted in the pursuit of his investigation. They were convicted of aiding and abetting the removal of material from an airplane crash site, but the judge suspended their sentences. The case is under appeal. Take us over and show us what testing was done. Earlier reports of explosive residue on the right side of the wreckage at Calverton had been shelved by investigators. Most laid to rest when secondary analysis turned up negative at the FBI's Washington, D.C. crime lab. Said the New York Times, certain federal agents calling the FBI's laboratory in Washington a black hole remained convinced that the Bureau was hiding its positive lab confirmations. Mr. Sanders' conclusions were likewise rejected by FBI investigators. Chemicals said to be exhaust residue were described instead as common industrial glue and explosive residue found in the plane's interior attributed to bomb training exercises conducted earlier aboard the 747. Brought in containers onto the aircraft. The, the trainer, the dog trainer, takes it out of the, of the can making sure to not contam cross-contaminate. Places it wherever it is, whether it's the, the dead cord or the C4 or the, or the powder. Places that around, then lets the dog come in, find they, it. They said it was, it was spilled in St. Louis on June 10th. And the officer who did the exercise said he left the plane no later than 12.15 p.m. The plane took off at 12.35 to Hawaii, fully loaded with passengers, caterers, the catering was already done. Uh, 400 people went to Hawaii. They boarded that plane an hour before, at least. So how can that be explained? Well, right next door, there was another 747 that took off at 1.30. That's where the bomb training exercise most likely took place. Furthermore, let's say, OK, given the benefit of the doubt, the guy was wrong. He left the plane at 11, you know, and everyone loaded after him. Well, he didn't do the exercise in the same place they detected the, the explosive. You know, they detected the explosives on external plane parts. They ex detected explosives in the passenger cabin where the, all the most of the damage was done to the aircraft. That's where these explosives were. That's, that's, that's highly, that's, that's evidence. Now, there are documents that I can show you that have, that show Whiskey 105 being activated that day. Activated as a naval operations area? Uh, yes. Where everybody uh, else keeps out, or what happens? There? Yes, yes. Uh, it's just you're not. It, it's a warning. It's it's to they send a, a notice to mariners and things like that. Uh, this actually these documents came from the Navy directly, so it's not even from the Coast Guard. The documents say yes, whiskey 105 was hot that day. Stalkup and fellow investigators have used radar data to plot the movement of surface ships around whiskey 105 on the night of the TWA disaster. Many of those vessels remain unidentified including several heading away from the site of the disaster at high speed. The Navy originally denied having warships in the area, a claim undercut by James Kaustrom, the FBI's lead investigator, in a conversation with Reed Irvine of Accuracy in Media. Why is Accuracy in Media involved in the TWA 800 investigation? TWA 800 investigation is very important because it gets to the uh, heart of the question of can we have a government that is so dishonest that it covers up uh, the cause of a tragedy that killed 230 uh, people?